Something could happen on this show. You never can tell. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe. I'm Pam. I'm the director of the Dick Biondi film that's been in progress for about six and a half years now. And I want to thank everybody that's been supporting us. And I want to introduce my co-host, Joe Farina, who's the director of communications and marketing for the Dick Biondi film. And he's my co-host on the Rock and Roll Show, Joe Farina. Hi, Joe. Uh, hi, Pam. Thank you very much for that awesome introduction. Hope everybody's doing all right out there. Uh, before we introduce our very special guest, we want to make sure that you uh, like the Dick Biondi Film Facebook page, join the Dick Biondi Film Facebook group, check out our website at dickbiondifilm.com. Uh, and uh, I know it's a tough time out there for everybody, but if you can think about maybe making a small donation to help uh, finish our film. Uh, we would really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, it's our pleasure to introduce to you a, a fantastic singer, songwriter, all around fantastic guy. And uh, he's, we're so happy that he's uh, joining us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, from the new Colony 6, please welcome Mr. Bruce Matty. Bruce, how you doing, buddy? Good evening, everybody. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. Glad to be here and glad to be with anybody watching as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bruce, for joining us. This is so exciting. It's a pleasure. We're always happy to help. Awesome. Well, the New Colony 6 has been a great, great supporter of the Dick Biondi film. And again, I want to thank you um, for just recently being part of Dick Biondi Day. That was just so phenomenal. And fun. also, of course, for being part of our Good Times Rock and Roll fundraiser last year. That was a huge success. Thanks to you and the New Colony for headlining. And you guys have just been so great. We can't thank you enough. That was a lot of fun. And whenever you need us, just call. Oh, you're <laughs> thank awesome. You. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, What's happening? Well, you, you're happening. Uh, oh, right. So happy to have you on uh, on the show. Happening. And... Uh, wanted to ask you first if you could talk to talk to us and tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got into music and what were uh, some of your influences growing up. Funny, since the last time we spoke, <laughs> a mm -hmm. couple of things came to mind that uh, I always remember in various uh, stories that I tell of the past and my kids go, no, there's no possible way. But, you know, as I realized it, speaking with them recently, is that my early uh, beginnings was really in country and Western. It was probably the time where WJJD was popular, mm -hmm. and it was just changing over from uh, Ricky Nelson, Everly Brothers, and those were the popular things on the radio. And uh, at the same time, prior to uh, noticing this, uh, I started out, uh, playing a ukulele, which it was my father's. Uh, later on, uh, somebody that he worked with needed money, and he gave him uh, $10 in exchange for uh, an acoustic guitar. So when he brought the guitar home, I'm thinking he still felt, felt that it was the biggest mistake he ever made. But uh, I played ukulele, and he brought this uh, acoustic home, and I'm like, well, what are what are these other two strings for? You know, there's like six strings on this thing. My hand was hardly big enough to play. But uh, with all that being said, I picked it up, figured it out. And uh, prior to that, I played accordion for probably a good four, four and a half years. You know, 120. Did it all. <laughs> yeah, De, De Contina was the thing. In fact, I actually, years later, got a chance to actually work with them as a child accordionist. Really? Uh, and uh, I also got a picture with him uh, even later on. Wow. He didn't remember me because this was not like 35 years later. But at any rate, yeah, early on, uh, there was a, a place in Chicago on Broadway near, um, what is that, uh, Montrose? There's a bus turnaround just when you get to the end of the route. And at the end of the route, there was a place, it was a, a bar, mostly country western, three, four piece piano uh, drums guitar and there was a guy named Big Bill Schaefer who played there but he was also the bouncer and we would go down there because we were like 13 and 14 years old at the time he said listen you guys can hang in the alley and listen and I'm like this is pretty cool <laughs> yeah I'd say 
really that was like pre, um, well, it was just uh, pre, actually it was pre high school. We used to sneak down there because a friend of mine was a few years older and he could drive. So we could, you know, make it down at the club and listen. Uh, so really that's where I got started. And I never really wanted to sing, sing at all, uh, which brings up another story because years later um, we had several groups uh, before the colony, before the Ravels going backwards. Um, there was a group called Care that I had. It was an AP show group, which eventually went into a power trio because the disco came in and then we competed with that. But going back further than that, we had a job with uh, my first group called the Silhouettes. And after the Silhouettes was the Regents. But in between there, we got this job playing at a teen uh, party at uh, a YMCA. In fact, that was in Chicago, over by Sears, uh, Lawrence, and Damon in that area. And uh, we were doing all instrumentals, pretty much, because we didn't have any microphones. So they said, well, could you guys, like, sing a song or two? Could you sing? Does anybody sing in this band? We're like, I said, well, yeah, actually, I can do Ricky Nelson songs and a couple of other wow. things, but we don't have a microphone. So this one guy goes, oh, not a problem. They have a house PA in here. So okay. he went over, literally got a microphone and held it. There was no stand. He just that held it. amazing. To, so I could sing these songs. You did like, your debut in just no preparation, just put it out there. I think we did um, wow. a couple of Ricky Nelson tunes and maybe Sweet Little Sheila. I don't know. So tunes that were at the Everly Brothers. And they're like, well, at least you sang something. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I thought I would be more like the Ventures. I was happy with that. Yeah. You know, the first record, I just want to say, the first record I ever bought was Ricky Nelson, Poor Little Fool. Poor Little Fool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was actually, I, I liked him a lot better than Elvis, but when I was playing accordion one night, he was on television, and I'm looking at this thinking, that's the way to go. Mm. So much for the accordion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like you were a big uh, Ricky Nelson fan. Did you like him even when he uh, transitioned to like the country folk kind of phase as well? Oh, uh, yeah, that was the Co Stone Canyon band? Yes. We, we, we actually, believe it or not, um, during the uh, off season when we were playing, uh, not with the Colony or any other the groups, uh, Chuck Jobs, who was in the Colony and... Um, my drummer and myself, we did this uh, trio thing. And it just turned out, uh, we were somewhere in Oak Brook, and I found out that the Stone Canyon Band was performing in like Bellwood or some other neighborhood. And I'm like, gee, I wonder uh, where they're staying. Just so happened that somebody working where we were playing said, oh, they're staying in the hotel. I go, where? They go, right here. I'm like, oh you gotta gosh. be kidding. So stepping back a, a little bit, we had done some country tunes and we literally had sent material out to various places. One of the songs actually wound up with Ricky Nelson's manager, musical manager. And they said, well, yeah, we might use this. We may not. Now this was, uh, must've been around 1976, 77 in that area. Um, so, uh, our keyboard player, Chuck, also was a big Ricky Nelson fan. And I said, we're going to go see Ricky Nelson. He goes, how? I go, well, after we're done playing, we're going to go to the front desk and just say, hey, where's Ricky Nelson? And they <laughs> ask us, well, who are you? And we'll say, well, we're in the band, which we did. And it worked. Oh so they gave us the room number. We went up there and we knocked on the door and it was, I don't know, might have been just before midnight. And all of a sudden there's a voice, who is it? Uh, and we said, well, you know, we're with the band downstairs. We just wanted to say hi. And he opens the door. And now <laughs> Chuck Jobs, he's, he was standing there in awe. He's like, and he's staring at him. I go, knock it off. <laughs> 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 he, he just sat for maybe, at, at best, four and a half minutes. And he goes, well, okay, good night. Nice to see you guys. And I never even mentioned, I said, I, I didn't mention that he had a song oh, that we had wow. sent them that really actually just never happened because it just didn't. And a couple of years later, and actually you had the plane crash with the Stone Canyon band of several of the guys on there that, yeah. uh, you know, passed away in that accident. But strange things do happen. Yeah. Gosh. Well, that's an interesting story. That's a great story. Wow. Well, that's, a, that's, that's, awesome. a, that's a weird that's one. That's very There's, cool. The, yeah. When we, we were doing other jobs also, 
uh, we did an appearance with um, Wayne Cochran's band. And when they got there, the guitar player said, he goes, you know, if something happened to my amp. Do you mind if I use your amp? I was playing a Thunder uh, Super Reverb. And uh, I said, well, sure, not a problem. So they came on, they did their stuff. You know, they, they had this whole show going on and Wayne Cochran would run around and pour whiskey and booze and everybody's drink and ruin it. Uh, so they got done and they just left, jumped on the bus, away they go. So we go up to play and I'm like, oh, my app must be unplugged, could be unplugged. So I'm like, no, it's not unplugged. And I reached back there. The guitar player had taken the fuse and the fuse cap out of my amplifier. Apparently he blew his fuse, didn't have one. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I, I wanted to play guitar out of the PA system, which was very odd at the time, you know. Mm, <laughs> Just yeah. Strange. Wow. Gosh. But fun. Crazy you rock know? and roll stories. <laughs> yeah, crazy rock and roll. <laughs> that's the way yeah, it that's, goes. That's rock. how it is, you know. <laughs> but you know, so, through all the all the groups, um, you know, coming up through grade from grade school through high school and, and forward after that, yeah, we had uh, the silhouettes, the regents. Uh, at that point, after the regents, I wound up with the Ravels, meeting those guys, and did a stint with them. We recorded uh, five or six tunes, which actually did good on WCFL yeah. Chicago Countdown for several weeks. One mm -hmm. song we still do in our show called Little Girl. The Ravels actually recorded that, and we were going to bring it to the colony, and it just never got that far because right about that same time, they were taking a turn from the garage band and that kind of sound to a little bit more sophisticated uh, sound. So that never happened, and uh, that might have been 1966, 67 in that area sometime. Okay. And how did you end up uh, joining the new Colony 6? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I was familiar with the guys from, uh, you know, being down around um, recording studio uh, on State Street. Uh, you know, we'd bump into each other. Uh, guys would wander in and wander out. And it's really through uh, an equipment uh, sound guy that we had that introduced me. And I was more friendly with Ray um, at the time, uh, Wally Kemp. Uh, before there were changes that happened where Les Cummel came in as a bass player who actually was with the Revels, We brought him into the Revels, And uh, before Chuck Jobs joined the colony, uh, he was actually with the Revels. Mm -hmm. And before uh, Bruce Gordon, the bass player, joined, he was with the Revels. So by the time I was there, we had more people from the Revels in the colony than there were a colony. But yeah. during all those years of the colony, there were so many people. They said, well, I was a member. I'm like, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> and I still <laughs> run into that, like on Facebook or, uh, you know, some uh, Twitter, you know, people still reach out. And I'm like, really? I have no clue who you are. <laughs> but that's, you know, how it is. And uh, later on through the years, as the, as the group kept changing members, uh, the sound naturally changed as well. Uh, yeah. And then just like all uh, groups, everybody kind of goes their way and uh, uh, several sure. went to their own businesses, that type of thing, because they're like, well, you know, this is coming to an end, like all things do, unless you're the Rolling Stones, you just regroove and keep going. But uh, yeah, that's the downside, is like you really enjoy several years with the, the people that you like, you're making music, you're making the people happy with what you're doing, and, and eventually that tie turns, and it's like some can turn, some go a different way, and that's what I did. I went into mostly recording, I'm uh, doing work with my oldest son, Aaron Chase. Uh, he had um, uh, SmartWorks Studio in Palatine, and then he does recording now. We still do at DLS Studios mm -hmm. in uh, Stone Park. That's he'll bring wonderful. Me, he'll bring me on on different projects, and I'll, he'll say, I need a bass part. I need a yeah. guitar lead. And then when he's done with it, I'm like, is that me? Did, what you do to that? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's technology. wonderful that you're working with your son. I think that's very cool that you're doing that. It, it's fun. It's fun. And yeah. the fun thing is that the colony is still together doing shows. Isn't that ever amazing? We oh. did our, um, we got together again. We did a show at the park was, must have been 1988. And from that point on, we said, let's keep this together. Cause Ray didn't want to continue. And I said, well, you know, why don't you give it a try? I'll head this thing up. I'll push it ahead and let's see what happens. And mm. so we're, we're still doing that. Cause In you're kind of like the band manager now, aren't you? 
I'm just kind of like the guy who just calls everyone and say, you know, let's get together. We got this. We have to do that. And everybody's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling teeth. Yeah, well, but, you know, I know they have a good time. You all have a good time when you get together. And I know the crowds love it. It's a lot of fun. You can't deny that. And that's oh my cool. gosh to say for all the bands all the guys that are still out there playing you know we yeah. we were friends with the bucks and like i mentioned in a different conversation that carl and i every time we get together we're always talking about grammar school because we went to grammar school basically oh. together yeah. and uh, later on he uh, i did some time in lane and then my family moved too far north but uh, he was uh, had a group called the centuries before the buckinghams and at that time, we were the Revels, basically kind of like the colony Revels was happening at the same time. So we all knew each other, and some of us knew each other pretty good. We still chat uh, when mm -hmm. we get together. It's a lot of fun. And, of course, you get together whenever there's a Cornerstones of Rock show. That's also true. And that's, that's a real treat because talk about nonstop chaos in the <laughs> dress. <laughs> oh, those Everybody's shows are got awesome. a memory share, yes. It's, it's pretty amazing with the cornerstones of rock to have all those sensational bands on one bill. New Colony Six, Ides of March, Crying Shames, and, and Buckingham's. Yeah. And, and I've been, uh, Pam and I have been to a share, our share of uh, Cornerstone show. And not only are they fantastic to watch and to listen to, but, you know, Pam and I are lucky because we're able to kind of get, you know, on the inside of, of everything. Yeah. And, it's just great to see the uh, connections and the camaraderie that all of you have. Absolutely. You know, it's just a, you know, when Pam and I come down backstage and we just talk to everybody, everybody's just happy, ribbing each other, hugging each other. And it just seems to be, you know, there's just that special connection that, that yeah, everybody has. There. It is. We're all just glad to be there. We're glad to be somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the alternative, you know. And playing music and playing those songs that you, you, you know, you've made famous. And it's just that, a lot of fun. The best part of that is when you hear the people singing back. And sometimes if we screw up the words, they don't. <laughs> like, oh, that's oh, cute. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's just what it's always been. Yeah. It's awesome. So I understand that um, you have a concert, which you've been trying to do, and due to the COVID, it's being mm. postponed, postponed. But now you've got some news about it? Yes, actually, it's been postponed uh, since I think the original date was supposed to happen in April. Uh, and now uh, we did a live stream August 21st for the ticket holders because they couldn't see the show. So we notified them and said, you know, we're going to live stream this and only you will get the link. Mm -hmm. So now we've taken a step further and say, okay, for them, as well as anybody else who's interested, we are going to do a show uh, after Thanksgiving day after on November 27th. Okay. Now we're trying to do it live, but we're, we're kind of in between saying, well, It'll be a live stream where we actually play and people can interact like they did in the last one. Or we might have to record it depending on scheduling and such and everybody's travel arrangements to be able to make it to the studio. We might just do that and put it out as a production uh, on that same date, okay. November 20th. So something's going to happen one way or another. That's Are you going to make an announcement then so everybody knows? Um, you're oh, going to open it up to the public so anybody can come and be part of it? Or Yes, yes. That'll be okay. on our website, and we're going to be getting something out there probably within the next 10 days or so. It'll well, be... be sure and send it to us, and we'll put it on our page too, on the Dick Biondi <laughs> film page, so everybody Great. that's watching, you'll, you'll hear about it. Absolutely. Great. And speaking, excuse me, speaking about yeah. Dick Biondi, I didn't want to forget to mention that, you know, way back when he was still doing the toy drive, we would do gigs because uh, the colony never played that late. You know, he was going like 24 hours or till two in the morning, whatever it was. And I would make a point to say, well, at the time I was living in Palatine, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, at that time I was living in Lombard, I would go to Yorktown, stop by in the afternoons if we went, we'd buy a toy and you'd give it so that they could donate mm -hmm. it or give it away. And gee, there was uh, uh, the uh, in Vernon Hills, we went there, the one mm -hmm. in uh, Yorktown, Lombard, and there was another one, I think it was uh, Bolingbroke, the, the three I remember that we would okay. show, just 
say hi, sing a song, keep going. You know. Yeah. Did you, did you say you lived in Lombard? Because I lived in Lombard most of my life. We were there in probably 1976, 77, 78. Oh, okay. Prior to that, I was only Chicago born and raised. And then we would uh, go to one town or another for whatever reason, depending <laughs> on in the market. Yeah. And, it, and Bruce, I wanted to ask you, um, how can our viewers, our audience, uh, stay connected and stay in touch with, with you and the New Colony 6? How can they do that? Just check out our site, www.newcolony6, all spelled out, dot com. And uh, that's the best way they can call. They can send an email. We'll respond. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've been doing that for quite a while. Okay. Great. Are you on Facebook as well, or uh, do you have a Facebook uh, page? That's an odd thing. I've got a nephew that takes care of that for me because – I, I told him, I said, you know, it's really strange. I don't really go there, but if it pops up in my phone, I'll respond. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I never really attack it myself. I wait, and I'm kind of a responsive type person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, so we're, people I, could send I, you I a message if they wanted to. Yeah. Yes, they can do that from our <laughs> website. Website I do, which is bad enough. So my, my son says, Jesus, you got to get a handle on this. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we have that much time left, but we'll see. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. Yeah. Well, let's see. We, yeah, we're about there. We're about that time. Uh, anything else, Joe, we need to ask Bruce? Yes, just real quick. Just me being a music fan and kind of a guitar fan and all that. Just curious, what kind of... Uh, gear and guitar uh guitars do you like to use uh now as, as you now. perform well yeah originally it was a silver tone <laughs> way back when but, yeah. but uh oddly enough uh guild star fire four uh two of those that i've had uh customized in a way and um uh i've always liked um solid bodies neck throughs and so i found guitars called Barrington and people are always looking at it like what does that say what is it and one day I was at a shop on Clark Street near Foster I think they're out of business but they were over there forgot what they were called and I wandered in because I was looking for a guitar to put a synthesizer on I didn't want to put it on my gills and on the wall was a couple of Barringtons. I'm like, well, what are these things? I have no idea. And the, we went back and forth and I said, okay, I'll be back. I wound up buying three of them just to make sure that if I needed a part, I had it in the closet or something. But I've been using this one guitar. It's, I call it salmon. People say it's pink. I go, no, it's salmon uh, for a long time. And it can just about do any style that you need. Uh, it's just comfortable. And um, I found it. I'm like, this is it. This is the last one I'm ever going to buy. And the other ones naturally was my, my Rickenbacker 12 string that I got in 1964. I think it was Perry's Music on Higgins. And I think I paid $604 and change, brand new. And it was like, <laughs> that was big because you had to have that. Plus, I had the Country Gentleman. So in the Ravels, we did a lot of Beatles music. Oh, sure. I, I hated the country gentleman. It was just bulky and it just sounded miserable, which then I traded for a Strat. And it was a 62 Strat, which I should have kept. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, I sold it to a guy named uh, she, Sanford. And I think he gave me a car back then that I think it ran okay. Not, not great, but it was, you know, it was worth the trade. <laughs> Um, oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> well, we're so glad that you were able to join us uh, tonight, Bruce. It was great to catch great up to with you and uh, always, always appreciate it, my friend. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joe and Pam. You guys are doing mm -hmm. a great job and hope the project uh, gets up running and done so you can sit back and relax and enjoy it. Thank you. We appreciate you. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, Stay safe out there, and thanks for being with us. We always appreciate having you with us. Right, Joe? Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Real quickly, dickbeyondyfilm.com. Like our Facebook page. Join our Facebook group. Please consider making uh, a donation to help get the film done. Every amount counts. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, everybody. And thank you, thanks again, Bruce. Okay, thank you both. Okay. Bye, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye-bye.